just pray. Father, we just love you and we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. We have not come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman. We come into the house of God to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Also, we would ask that you not only bless us today, but bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will give you the praise. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest, Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare, our Adventist brothers and sisters, the Catholic brothers and sisters, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Lord, we thank you for Ecclesia Church, Lord. We give you the praise give you the glory, give you all the honor. How good it is to be in the presence of the Lord. Father, bless them as you would bless us and we'll thank you forever. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we say amen. Well, just real quick, we're also being um, lots of people all over the planet just joining us right now by live streaming and we want to welcome you get your bibles out wherever you're at and we're going to go to the word of the lord today and it's going to be a blessing i believe that god wants to speak to you right there wherever you're at god wants to speak to you so come on turn your heart towards the things of the lord and let the lord speak to you as he's going to with all of us that are in this room i want to take you back to hebrews if i may second chapter second verse we're going to spend a little time in this second verse because it's a powerful verse. You know, we're not here trying to get fast food. We want good food, and it takes time to, to make it right and to, you know, to savor it and to properly season it so that we can get all the flavor we can out of the Word of God today. And so here in Hebrews, the second chapter, you know, we're talking about Jesus and the comparison, if you will, with Jesus and angels and how much greater is Jesus than any angel. And you'll find that all through the scripture is that how great Jesus is and we can put our trust in angels or put our trust in uh, prophets and put our trust in men, put our trust in other things. Why not put all of our trust and heart and emphasis on Jesus Christ? And that's what really this is all about and as we read this, there's some interesting things that we're going to look at. I want to take you, if I may, and then I'll come back and give you the title of the message. But I want to share with you out of uh, Hebrews, the second chapter, in verse number 2. It says these words, verse 2. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receives a just reward... And here I just wanted to emphasize the words, if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast. I don't know if you got that or not. Let me say it again. If the word spoken by angels proved steadfast. I don't know if that takes your mind anywhere, but let me say it one more time. If the word spoken by angels proved steadfast. Can you imagine? Here's the word of God. It's spoken by God. In fact, think about it just for a moment. The first chapter of Genesis, the first 20 first, 21 verses, seven times it refers to as God said. God said. God said. God said. God said. We see God speaking and creating all the time. As his word goes out, he creates and brings forth life. We see Jesus who is the word. We see Jesus speaking the word. We see angels now speak and prove it that it's steadfast. Then we find ourselves finding the apostles where they speak the word also. In fact, let me just show you some things in Hebrews. Why don't you just, while you're there anyway, in fact, let's just take a look at this real quick in the 11th chapter in verse number 3. Of Hebrews, it says this by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made with the things that are visible. 
In other words, God didn't make something out of the visible. He made something from the invisible. And he spoke the word, and that which was invisible becomes visible. Then God uh, speaks it, it becomes visible. Man takes a hold of it, and what does he do? He makes things out of it. The very chair that you're sitting in right now at one time was invisible, and God spoke it. And all the elements and makeup of that chair... Man puts together and makes a chair out of it. But it was an invisible thing by the spoken word of God by God. Then we find the apostles themselves. Here's, here in 2 Corinthians, keep this in mind, just watch this just for a moment. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, in verse 13, just put it up on the overhead. It says, for since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke. And he says this, and also believe and therefore speak. Sometimes we don't realize what's right before our very eyes. We see this morning, watch this, God speaking the word of God. We see Jesus speaking, who is the word, speaking the word of God. We see the apostles speaking the word of God. We see, if you will, angels speaking the word of God. But when it comes to the church speaking the word of God, we pick on it, we call it names, we belittle it. It shouldn't be. If anybody ought to speak the word of God over their lives, over the situations of your existence, it ought to be you and I that are born of the spirit of God. Sometimes when we do, we get criticized. Let's talk about it. They call it the blab it and grab it theology. They call it the, if you will, the name it and claim it. They call it that, you know, that uh, if you will, the confession people. Well, I'm sorry. Did you know that every church on the planet ought to be a confession church? Because I'd like to know how you got saved if you didn't confess Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. Stop and think about it for a moment. In Romans, the 10th chapter, in the 10th verse, it says you must believe with your heart and speak and confess with your mouth unto salvation. Well, how did you get saved if you weren't a confession person? You didn't just think about it and get saved. You had to speak it out of your mouth according to that. Now, we're talking about something that's important for all of us to realize. If it's true that we're a blab it and grab it, and if I can grab it, then please teach me how to blab it. If I can name it and claim it, then if I can claim it, name it, teach me how to name it so I can claim it. I mean, let's don't be dumb. Let's don't kick out the baby with the bathwater. We see it with God. We see it with Jesus. We see it with the apostles. We see it with the angels. But the church sits silent. It should not be that way. We ought to be people that are speaking the word of the Lord all the time over the situations of your life. And that's why I've entitled this message. And I love this. When you speak the word. When you speak the word, the world changes. Deborah and I have lived in this all of our lives. We have spoken the word over our marriage. That's why our marriage is so good. We've spoken the word over our children. That's why there were a time when our children were, were I mean, they're probably like most children. You just wanted to put them in the deep freeze until they're 27 years old. You know, does anybody know what I'm talking about? But I remember mama up in the middle of the night speaking the word of God over them. Today I stand before you and tell you, not only was God faithful, but the word worked and they're all in the ministry serving the Lord. So why throw out the baby with the bathwater? Why don't let criticism and judgment come your way? Why not understand that the biblical principle that we're talking about, listen to me now, let me say it again, that the biblical principle that I'm talking about can change your entire existence. 
can change your future, can change your life, and better yet, change the world around you by just speaking what God says instead of what you think or what you feel or what circumstances tell you. Speaking what God says instead of the foolishness of what man says. I don't care what philosophers say. I don't care what politicians say. I don't care what economists say. I want to know what God says. And when the world and the pressure of the world is on me, when things don't go the way that I would like them to go, I have got to put my mouth in gear and speak the word of the Lord. And to our deaf community, listen to what I'm going to say to you. I'm not talking about you just speaking out of your mouth. I'm talking about you speaking with your hands because you hear with your heart. You don't hear with just your ears. So all of us in here need to speak the word of God. Now if people criticize you, let them criticize you as long as you're grabbing it. Let them criticize you as long as you're saying it and getting it, as long as life is changing. Now, let me just show you something that God wants you to see today so that you don't misunderstand and you don't immediately turn off how important it is for you to speak the word of God in situations of your life. Listen closely, and I'll share some things with you. Three things that God gave me to share with you that we see in the apostles, that we see in the prophets, that we see with the angels, that we see with Jesus, that we see with the, with the uh, God himself about speaking the word of the Lord and why I need to speak the word of God. Three things that will help you so that you can speak the word of God and feel comfortable about doing it. Is that all right? Here's three things. Just listen and just let it fall and let the word of God fall on your heart and see it for yourself right out of the scripture. First of all, let me just share this with you. Number one thing, why you need and why I need to speak the word of God. It brings you to a mature level. You know, that's the goal of God is to get you to grow up and get me to grow up where the winds of doctrine don't come and knock me over and blow me all around all the time, that I'm not a puppet to this planet. I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. And I'm mature enough to understand what God says. And God wants me not to stay a baby, but to grow up into maturity. Did you know that that's the commission of the church is to get the people to grow up into maturity, that we not stay children, that we not stay in a place of wandering and wondering what's going to happen, but really have a destiny, a purpose and direction in life, that God wants you to be mature in everything that you do. Mature in approaching a wedding and marriage. A, 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 peer, a, a Mature as you raise your children. Mature towards your finances. Mature towards your business. Mature towards life. Mature is the things of the Lord. It is not just time. It is not just how old you are. It is not just whether or not you know a few verses or not. It is not how long you've been in church that makes you mature. In fact, let me show you something that God wants to take you to a mature level. And the mature level is determined by how you speak the word of God. Watch this. And how you do the word of God. May I take you to James? You're right there in Hebrews anyway. Go back with me into James in the third chapter, if you will. Just go back in your Bible. And let's take a look at James just a few pages behind Hebrews, you'll find James, the third chapter. And let's look at verse number two. Now listen to the heartbeat of God as the inspiration, the word of God is being spoken to all of us today. Please hear me. Listen to this. Verse number two. For we all stumble in many things. Stop right there. Aren't you glad God wrote that? We all stumble in many things. Has anybody ever stumbled since you've been a Christian in many things? You don't have to raise your hand, but we all have. The rest of you that didn't want to raise your hand, you're just little liars, and we'll cast the devil out of you later on anyway, because we've all stumbled in many things. And guess what? But he comes along and he makes a statement after that true statement. If anyone, I want to just, just stop you right there. The word if is a great word. It means you can do it or not do it. It means that it's your call, your choice. 
And I love the word anyone. Did you know that what he's saying isn't just for the apostles, just isn't for the disciples of Jesus, just isn't for those days that you'll find the writer writing to the Hebrew believers? No, he's not. He says anyone. Anyone means you. Anyone means me. It can be you. It can be you. Anyone means you up there, you back there in a corner. It's you up on top. It's you way back over there in that far corner. Anyone means anyone. If anyone does not stumble in word. Now, in other words, there's a words that are going to come out of your mouth. If you don't stumble in those words, how do you stumble? You trip over the words or you do the wrong thing. If anyone doesn't stumble in word, he says he is a perfect man. You ought to circle the word perfect in your Bible. You know what it means? Mature. The real translation is mature. In other words, you'll find your maturity level not by how long you've been around. Your maturity level is not by how many verses you can, you know, memorize or heard before or how long you've been a member of a church or how old you are or how much experience you have in the world. That's not maturity, God. Maturity comes when you don't stumble in your word. And he says, if you don't do that, then you're a perfect man and you're able to bridle your whole body. In other words, you can control your flesh by controlling your mouth. Let me say that again. You can control your flesh by controlling your mouth. Or in other words, you'll never control your flesh until you start to control your... Are you listening to me? You'll never control your flesh until you start to learn to control your mouth. We speak a lot of stuff that we feel, a lot of stuff that we see. We speak a lot of stuff that is inside of us that just comes out. But if you can control and speak the word of God, what God says about your marriage, what God says about your kids, what God says about your life, what God says about your business, what God says about your future, what God says, oh my goodness, all of a sudden you are now a, now you can control the destiny of your life. Maturity, listen to me, let me define it for you, is somebody who speaks the word of God and does the word of God. It's not just somebody who can speak the word of God and doesn't ever do it. Maturity isn't a length of time. Maturity is an action that you take on your part. And God wants to take you to that level of maturity by speaking the word of God. When you look at your checkbook, what do you say? When you look at an argument in a family, what do you say? When you see your kids going the wrong way, what do you say? When your prayers aren't quite being answered like you'd hoped they'd be answered, especially not in the time when you want them to be answered, what do you say? See, a one who controls his words in accordance to what God says controls his life and brings about a mature level that's great. When I read this, the next verses afterwards talk about the power of the tongue and illustrate how important the tongue is. A little member, it says, in your body, like the tongue, can set on fire the entire course of your life. It can be from the pit of hell and ruin your life because you sink in your own ship with your own words that you're launching. And we need to be a people, like it says, just read the next bunch of verses and you'll see that. Verse number 8 came along, and when I read verse number 8, when I remember reading this as a young man, in my 20s, I said, oh man, if I could just control my mouth, everything would be good. If I could just speak the word of God, that's what it said. And then verse 8 came along, and in verse number 8, let's just pop it up for us. It says these words, but no man can tame his tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I said, I'm doomed. <laughs> I can't do this. No man can control his tongue. And I went to God and I said, God, I don't have a chance, do I? I'm a big mouth saying all the wrong things and I can't change this, God. God said, read it again. And I read it again. No man can tame his tongue. God said, read it again. No man can tame his tongue. 
No man can tame his tongue. God, I'm reading it. He says, yeah, but you're not seeing it. A man by himself can't tame his tongue, but a man with God can tame his tongue. Without God, I'm going to speak the things of the world. Without God, I'm going to speak what I feel. Without God, I'm going to speak my logic instead of God's knowledge. Without God, I'm going to say what other people say. But with God and the power of the Holy Ghost, I can speak the word of God over my circumstances. Hear me now and change my entire circumstances like the apostles, like Jesus. It is a creative power that changes the whole world that I live in. If it can destroy me, then it can also build me. Is anybody listening to me now? We need to speak the word of God because it brings us to a mature level. Number two, why we need to speak the word of God. It builds confidence in me. When I speak the word of God, it doesn't change God. Sometimes people think they're speaking the word of God. Look, God, I'm speaking the word of God. I'm speaking what you say. And God is like in heaven saying, wow, they're speaking the word of God. I guess that's how I'm just going to change for them. It doesn't work that way. What the word of God does, it changes me. And it changes me in me. And all of a sudden, I have a place where I become confident. All of a sudden, I'm trusting. All of a sudden, I'm seeing something I never saw before. And oftentimes I will say what I see or say what I feel or say what the circumstances are instead of the confidence of of who he is and what he says. Is what I feel greater than what he says? No. Is what I see greater than what he says? No. I have got to have a confidence that his word supersedes all of my sense realm. And I have got to have a confidence on the inside of me. The Bible says that nothing's impossible to him that what? Believes. And if I can keep my confidence up long enough until it manifests or come to pass, I have now got what it is I am believing God for. And when I hear the word of God, it builds a confidence on the inside of me. There's a saying going around, it is what it is. I want you to know something. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It is what he says it is. And that means what you think it is can be changed as long as you keep your confidence through this whole thing. Is anybody listening? The Word of God makes it very clear in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse number 17. Just pop it up on the overhead. Let's check it out for yourself. You ought to underline. For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Remember, our deaf section, your hearing comes from hands. Through the eye gate, down into your heart. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It does not say faith or confidence or trust comes by thinking. In fact, let me give you an illustration. Have you ever come into church and you walk out and you got your shoulders back, you got victory, man, just right at your tips. You just feel so good. You're walking to your car. You got confidence. You know you can just kick the slats out of whatever problems come your way. And by Monday, it feels like the slats just kicked out of you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The reason for that is because when you're here, you're built up with confidence in the Word of God, and you need to be, but you got to keep it going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when there isn't a preacher around preaching to you, and you do that by speaking the Word of God. And when I hear what I speak, all of a sudden what I speak drops into my heart. I get off of what I see. I get off of what I feel. I get off of what I think. I get off of what people say and I get back on what God says about this circumstance so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and see for a lot of us in here we know this but we forgot to do this a lot of us we could preach this and have preached it but we forgot to do it some of you and most of you never heard this in your life 
In fact, you were afraid of it. You thought you'd be one of those blab it, grab it, confession people. But I'm here to tell you something. If you really can grab it, then someone teach me how to blab it. Am I talking truth? And you know, all of us that are in here need to understand that faith comes. It builds a confidence on the inside of me. The more I hear the word of God instead of what my brain is telling me, what my flesh is telling me, what people are telling me, the more confidence I have in him coming through instead of myself. And that makes all the difference in the world because all things are possible to him that believes. Number one, why we ought to be a people that um, uh, speak the word of God is that it will cause you to be on a mature level. And number two, it'll build confidence in you. But I love number three. It'll change the world around you. By speaking the word of God, somehow the power of God is just released. And it changes the world around you. So many times people come to me and they make a statement, Pastor, uh, I see thousands of people at the church getting saved. You must say the right things. What do you say to those people? What message do you preach? I just preach the gospel. I can preach a message that's so contrary to getting saved and people get saved. You know why? Because the power of the word of God goes into their heart. It isn't the intellect that goes into their heart. It isn't the formula, three messages and three points and four points and all that. It isn't the harmony of the message that works. It's the power of the word of God. When the word of God is preached or when the word of God is out in the air, it changes the world that you and I live in. And people don't even know why they get saved, they run to the altar to get saved. They don't even know what you said. I will ask them, what did I say that got you saved? And they say, I have no idea what you said. I just needed to come and get right with God. Paul writes it like this. I don't come to you with the persuasive words of men's wisdom. I come to you in the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a power that you release that changes natural circumstances around you. That's why it is what it is, is from the pit of hell to a Christian. Are you following me? Because the word goes out and it changes the world that we live in. I didn't know how it was going to work with Deborah. But you know, there's times in our marriage that she had to speak the word of God. Because I sometimes, I guess, I thought I'm pretty nice. But maybe I'm a brat sometimes, you know. (laughs) She would walk away speaking the word of God. And I'd hear her speak the word. I knew I was off base when I hear the word coming out of her. And then sometimes I'd speak the word of God. We'd speak the word of God over our finances. We'd speak the word of God over our our lives. It changes the world that you live in. If I was sick, I would speak the word of God. God, I'm healed by your stripes. I felt miserable. I'm down. I'm going to see a doctor, but I'm going to get healed faster because I'm speaking the word. The word says I'm healed by the stripes of my Lord and Savior Jesus. When I'm insecure and I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I'll speak the word of God. If I feel like there's a demonic presence that wants to get me off track, and do something that's ungodly and unwise, I'll say greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. And I thank you, God, for the word of the Lord. If I'm broke and down and don't know how I'm going to financially make it, I'll make a statement like this. Your word says, God, that you meet all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. If I don't know how to make a decision on something, I'll I'll say, God, you say when I'm lacking wisdom, I could ask and I will receive. I am asking, Lord, in the name of Jesus that you give me wisdom and direction and hold me in my place so I don't go to the wrong place in my own foolish wisdom. And I thank you, God, because your word says I will receive that wisdom. You just speak the word of God. It'll not only change you, it'll change your children, it'll change your marriage, it'll change your finances, it'll change your dreams. 
It'll change your future. Listen to this old man, a grandpa, uh, in my, uh, pushing this year into my late 60s. And I want you to hear me now. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. My God, he's faithful. I have learned this principle. I didn't just learn it from somebody because it sounded nice. I learned it because I put it to work. And I can tell you, you can learn this now so you don't have to be my age to figure it all out. Hear what I'm saying. Let a grandpa tell you how to do things in the ways of the Lord. You need to learn and speak the word of God over every area of your life. It'll change the world that you live in. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Today, three things that we have learned out of Hebrews, the second chapter. These three things about speaking the word of the Lord. Number one, it will bring you to a mature level because he that controls his words controls his entire destiny. Wow, isn't that cool? Number two, it will build confidence in you so that you can keep on keeping on, stand and keep on standing. And number three, you will find that it'll change the world that you live in. And I just want to close by reading one verse to you, if I may. Listen to the verse, if I can, out of Proverbs, the fourth chapter, starting in verse number 20. My son, give attention, give attention to my word. Incline thine ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. Let me say it again. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. One more time. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. You know what that is? Anything that's contrary to what God says about you. Anything that's contrary to what God says about you is a deceitful mouth. He says, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes go straight ahead and your eyelids look, to, uh, look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all of your ways be established. Do not turn to the right. Do not turn to the left. Remove your foot from evil. And all you can do is speak the word of God, keeping your eyes on the things of God, and God will change your world. If God spoke to you today, give him a great big praise the Lord. We do that. Isn't that good? <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Could everybody remain seated? Nobody get up, nobody leave, because when you get up, you disturb everybody around you. They watch you instead of listening to what needs to be said for their life to get right with God. So everybody remain seated, sit down, and let's talk. I want to ask you this one question. I ask it every service. If you were to die in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's the question. Answer that question in your heart. Nobody needs to know but you and God. Everybody remain seated. Come on now. Answer the question. Let's get, give me your attention. If you were to die in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Your answer says a lot about who you are and where you're at with God, so let's talk about your answer. Some of you might have said, well, Pastor Jim, I think that I'm going to go to heaven. I think I'll make it. Can I tell you right here, the, you need to know this, nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven. Like whoever's a positive thinker is going to make it. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might have answered, well, I hope that I'm going to go to heaven. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible says you could hope your way into heaven. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I love God a whole lot. I, I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Guess what? Nowhere again. It's not in the Bible. Don't you think it would be in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I'm really a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Can I tell you something? If that's your answer, nowhere in the Bible does it say because you're good you get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you and respect you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. 
No man goes to the Father. You can't get to heaven your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And Jesus said these words in John, the third chapter, that you must be born again. That's how you get to heaven. Most people don't understand even what born again means that attend American churches today. They don't know what it means. All they know about born again people is they don't like them. They see them in movies portrayed as idiots. They read about them in books and stories like fools. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. Let me tell you what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible is that God is after all of your heart and all of your life. And Jesus, when he makes that statement, you must be born again, he's saying you got to give God all of your heart. you got to give God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you, all or nothing. Now listen to me. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. And he says these words. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? He said, people that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and you're not going to make it. What's lukewarm? Let me define it for you so that you understand. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Lukewarm, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Here's lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, watch this, but he's not everything, and that's lukewarm, and God knows it. And Jesus said you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. Now, some of you might say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I think I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class, put a cross around my neck or a St. Christopher. They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Can I ask you to show me that in Scripture because it's not in the Bible. And you're not going to make it if you think that's going to get you to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that's what Jesus said. And he says, you must be born again. And you're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. And that's what this is really all about. Today, in this safe and friendly place, we have laughed. We have sung the songs. We've clapped our hands. We've had a great time in the Word. You heard the Word, and God has spoken to you today. You know you're going to walk out of here with something different. Today is your day of salvation. If you haven't given God all of your heart and you haven't given God all of your life, you know it and so does God. And today God brought you to this safe and friendly place that because today is your day, you have a divine appointment with God to give him all of your heart and life. Don't ever leave this planet without this. You're not going to make it if you do. Today is your day. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? You've got to get right with God his way. But here's what I would suggest. If you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life, let's do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said all across this auditorium. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! And you hear that sound. Bang! Your hand goes up and I'll see it. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, in the uh, uh, foyers, outside. Uh, If you're hearing me by voice, we're down at the Love Rock Cafe. You can get your hand up before God. God will see it. Wherever you're at, in uh, uh, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, on the top, wherever you're at, in front, wherever you're at, get ready to put your hand up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand when you hear this sound, bang, what you're saying by the raising of your hand is, I, I, I want to give God all of my heart and give him all of my life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. Now listen to me. I already know and so do you. You know who Jesus is. You celebrate Christmas every year of your life. You celebrate Easter every year of your life. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know who Jesus was. But having head knowledge about who Jesus is and giving him all of your heart are two completely thing, different things. And you're going to have to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. And you're not going to get saved because you know who he is. Even the devil knows who he is and he's not going to get saved. It's about what you've done with your heart. And today is your day. 
all across this auditorium. If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you, get ready to raise your hand. If you've never given him all of your heart, if you've never given him all of your life, get ready to raise your hand. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Today is your day of salvation. Get ready to raise your hand. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Somebody will see me that I came with, or someone behind me will see me. Yep, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think and see instead of what God sees. Come on. Today is your day. Let me see your hand in a moment. When you hear this sound, pop in my hands together and you can put it right back down. If you've been running from God, get ready to put your hand up. Never given him all of your heart, you know who you are. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're not sure, make sure. I'm counting, here it is. It's your call now, I've done my job. Ready, here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, thank you. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, thank you, 20, thank you, 21, 22, 23, thank you, 24, thank you, God bless you. On this side, anybody on this side? 24, anybody in that family room? Anybody back there? Anybody back there? One more, one more time, I'm just gonna look this audience over one more time, don't miss this. I didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you. Listen to me now. Some of you need to get your hand up. I'm not gonna wait all day for you. Today is your day. There's 26. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's already 26 people. You know if you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 26 wise people. Now, here's what I want. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. I want all 26 of you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. And I know there's 27, 28, 29, 30. You didn't raise your hand, and you thought you got away, but God knows who you are. And you better stop messing with God before the door gets shut on you, and you miss out on God. And whoever you are that you didn't raise your hand, you need to get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. Get out of your seat and get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. You come right now. Come on, let's stand and welcome them as they come. All of you that raised your hand and anybody that should have, you come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Mercy that draws me near. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. No matter the road. Come on, you can come too. Oh, they're coming. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And it's your mercy that draws me near. Come on, come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh, they're still coming. 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 Come on. Come on home. Come on home. Come on home. And it's your mercy that draws me near. Thank God you guys have come. Real quick, listen to me just for a moment. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. Let me tell you what he's going to do. Three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. Now he comes in because you invite him. He's a gentleman and won't come in unless you invite him in. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, free literature about now that you're a Christian, what to do next. That's very important. What does God want you to do? Read that. It's simple. Just go through it. Thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have that will help you get strong. We give away friends here. They're called spiritual personal trainers. Personal trainer, you know what a personal trainer does. This is a spiritual personal trainer. Meet you before church service, buy you coffee, tea, nachos, go over some scripture, pray for you during the week, and encourage you to get back to church. Because if they can get you back to church and learning something, and eventually you're going to get hooked in to the things of God, grow and go forward in the ways of the Lord. So come on, you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. 
and let us help you to do that. Is that okay? So please make a left turn. The people who came with will follow you. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.